46, uh, 46 through 49. We'll pray and then, and then we'll read it. God, I do thank you for the opportunity to, to open your word. Lord, I thank you for the, the chance to speak and, and share and share with people. Lord, I, I pray that we could open this together and, and learn together, Lord, and, and just see some things that maybe you, you, you want us to see. Um, Lord, I pray that they would be your things. I, I pray that the things that have been prepared uh, that aren't you, Lord, that they would, that they would fall away and they'd, and, they'd, and they'd be pushed to the side and that the, the only things that would come out of my mouth would be things given by God and, and, and what you have to share to us this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll, I'll read the passage and then we'll, we'll go back kind of over it a little bit. So Luke 6, 46 through 49, he says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you who he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently, I had a hard time with that for like three weeks straight, that word. Uh, the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. And so we're just going to go through and just a few things that God kind of showed me that maybe I hadn't seen before, or maybe they were just reminders, uh, and, and just share them with you. Um, so the first, the first thing, right, right off the bat, right, verse 46, it says, you know, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? And... What a reminder, what a, what a prompting, right, you know, to, to say, Jesus, you're my Lord, and then you don't do what he's saying, it's kind of like, uh, you're missing it here, right? <laughs> How can I be Lord if you don't do the things which I say? Um, you know, as an as a, as a unbeliever, you know, maybe God's drawing you, maybe, maybe you're a new believer, and, and, and you've just recently come to, to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and... I just want to say to you, when you make that decision to follow Jesus Christ, you are accepting him as your savior and he is saving you from hell. And that is an amazing, wonderful gift that only Jesus Christ is capable of doing. But yet you're also accepting him as the Lord of your life, as the, the captain of your ship, as the driver of the car, or however you want to look at it. You're giving control of your life to Jesus Christ. And anybody that sells, if you will, salvation to you short of that is they're missing a very important part. Um, you get Jesus the Savior, and that's wonderful, and you also get Jesus the Lord, which is equally as wonderful. It's, it's not a punishment to give up the keys. It's a blessing to give up the keys, but you've got to give them up, and, and that's part of becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. And, you know, Matthew, Matthew 7, 22 through 23, at the end of it all, right, on Judgment Day, it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not done these things? Have we not professed to you that we are your followers? Have we not cast out demons? And Jesus will say to them, Depart from me, I never knew you. Well, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you know, we did all these things in your name. You did those things. Those weren't my things. I didn't do those things. I was not Lord. I was not captain. I was not in the lead. You say that, and you say you know me, and you say I'm your Lord, but I don't know who you are. <laughs> you know me, the, de the devil and the demons know me, but I don't know you. Me and you don't have a relationship. I don't want to get to the end and God say, well, you did a lot of good things, but I don't know you. That's... I don't want to be there, and I don't want any of you to be there. So, man, when you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and maybe, you're, you're, maybe God's working on you today in that, I just want to encourage you, you're accepting him as Lord and Savior. And that's a blessing. It's a great thing to have, and it's a great thing to hang your hat on, but it's there. James 1.22 says, But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Again, that deceiving of yourself, right? We, we say a prayer and we walk through life saying, oh, everything's good, and I will, I will be in heaven, 
and I know Jesus, and he has saved me, and everything's wonderful, and you're deceiving yourself. I don't want to be deceived when it's over, and I don't want you to be deceived when it's over. When he's Lord, you get the fullness of the relationship of Jesus Christ, and that is where you unlock the promises that are in this. The promises that he gives people, you get when you're truly under the umbrella of God, when he is the Lord and he's leading and directing your life. And so often, I think, you hear about people who, man, it's just not going, it's just not going the way it should go. I'm a Christian and things should be going this way or that way. And, and uh, you know, I would just encourage you, well, is he Lord? Is he Lord? If he's, if he's Lord, that's where that fullness of life comes. Um, and it, anything else is, is going to leave you short. Uh, you know, and, and, and then for somebody who says, well, I'm not a new believer. I know Jesus is my Lord, and, and I know this stuff, and this is elementary children's church stuff. I'm, I'm already there. Well, I would encourage us, you, well, let it serve as a reminder, Lord, Lord. Let it serve as a reminder of his position in your life, of what his position should be in your life, of what his position is in your life. And, and, if, and if he's on that highest place and he's in that position, then, man, praise him and thank him because you've got the best captain a ship could want. But let it also serve as a little dipstick check. Are there areas in my life where he's not Lord? Are there areas in my life that I have not given up, that I've held on to? Yes, I've claimed him to be Lord, and I've put my faith in him, and, and I'm saying I will do and I will be, but are there things that we're still holding on to? Are there areas that we need to just examine a little bit closer and say, okay, God, maybe I've kept this one back from you. Maybe I've kept this little thing to myself. And if that be the what we find, give them up. Give them up. Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, but in their works they deny him. I've been a Christian for a while. I would say I profess to be a Christian. I know Jesus Christ. I, he's my Lord, and I'm, and I'm following him. But man, do my works say that? <laughs> You're not saved by your works, but there's some stuff in here. There's some sayings, as God calls them in this passage, that we should be about, the things that we should be about in life. Am I about them? Or do my words say I'm a follower, but my works deny him? Let that just be a, a check, right? My sheep hear my voice. I know them. What a blessing. God is saying, I know them. So if you don't want to be the guy in the last passage, right? You don't want to get there and God say, I don't know you. Well, it says right here, I know them, and they follow me. That's the part that kind of, right? <laughs> that's, that's the glue. That's what sticks it. And so true followers, believers, they're doers. They're not just hearers. They're doers, right? The Bible says, be a doer, not a hearer only. So what is this story? What does this little, this little story here tell us about what a doer looks like? What does a doer look like? I want to be a doer. You want to be a doer? I want to be a doer. What does a doer look like? Well, in this story, he tells us, right? He says, he says, whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them, I'll show you who he's like. Here it is. This is what a doer looks like. I'm going to make it plain and simple for guys like me to understand, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it simple. It's like a man building a house, and he lays a foundation, and he builds on the foundation, and the foundation is on a rock. That's what it, that's what it looks like. And a hearer is a guy that builds a house, and there's no foundation. There's no foundation, and that's kind of like pretty simple. I would almost call that common sense. Anybody in here live in a house without a foundation? Would you build a house without a foundation? That seems knuckleheaded, right? Like, Wait, what? Yeah, I'm building a house. No, I'm just this little two-by-four frame. We'll just put her up. Does it make any sense? It has to have a foundation. That only is common sense. And so I would say it's kind of common sense here. God puts it pretty simple. It only makes sense to have the foundation, to have Lord Jesus Christ as the rock that you build on. 
It only makes sense for that to be the center stone, the foundation, the bottom, the entry level, the glue that holds it all together where the weight is being carried. You know what I mean? It only makes sense. And again, as a new believer or an unsaved person, and he's tugging on you, man, I would tell you, lay your foundation on the rock. It, it only makes sense. Again, anything else will be frustration. Anything else will come up short. Anything else won't work. It'll feel empty because your house, when the stream comes and beats vehemently, which means violently, viciously, strongly, it'll crumble. Without the foundation, it'll crumble. And so to come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I would just encourage you more than anything, read the word of God. Know what these sayings are. Know who he is and just build a relationship with him. If I want to get to know Mike Fisher, I just spend time with Mike Fisher. It's not a magic formula or a special sauce. It's just get around Mike. Get around Mike and talk to Mike. Look at Mike. What does he drink? What does he eat? And get to know him. <laughs> and you get to know him, and that relationship builds, and that foundation builds, and there's strength. And, and we, we just, I don't know, sometimes we overcomplicate it, it feels like, right? You want a good foundation, you want to spend time with God, or you want, to, you want to live in a victorious life, just know God more today than you did yesterday. I tell my basketball guys, I don't need you to become LeBron James tomorrow. I just need you to not be as bad as you were yesterday. Okay? And if today you're better than yesterday, and tomorrow you're better than today, then in 100 days, you'll be 100% better than we're standing right now, and that would be great. You know what I mean? And then by the time we go four years, you're the greatest thing that has ever touched a basketball, right? So just get to know God a little bit more than you know him today. Don't ever come to the point where we say, yeah, you know what? I know God. That well is too deep to ever get to the bottom of. You don't know God as good as you need to or want to or as good as it could be, right? Just build that relationship and get to know him. Get to know him better, um, That's more or less it, right? Now, we're going to look at verse 48, and this is kind of the verse that jumped out at me. I'm going to read it again, and then we're going to look at, we're going to look at, at, at a few things that, that just jumped out at me when I, when I heard this and since I've been kind of reading it. So again, it says, I'm going to show you who he's like, and then verse 48. He's like a man who builds his house on a rock, who dug deep, laid a foundation on the rock, and when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against the house, it could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. Man, that's a good verse. That's a good verse. And so, to the new believer, to the unbeliever, to someone who's, who's maybe fresh or wrestling with God, to, to all of us, but this, this jumped out at me, this dug deep, this dug deep. I had never heard this story, ever. I was always reading it, I guess, wherever I grew up. The same story is in Matthew, and I don't know if it has it. Uh, and maybe, I, maybe they always read me the Matthew version. But this version says, he dug deep. And that just hit me, and I chewed on it for a couple weeks. Just it by itself, that idea of this digging that took place. And it said a few things to me that were kind of fresh and new, and, 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 here, and here they are, okay? Um, as a new believer... As, a, as an unsaved person maybe wrestling with God, this is what I would kind of share with you, I guess. Um, Jesus will meet you where you are when you come to know him. You do not have to work to become saved. That is an amazing blessing. Uh, a lot of religions and a lot of teachings across the world, there's this act of something that you have to do to become worthy to get this place. You have the right, if you will, to sit, next to the sun in heaven, and you don't have to do anything for that. God did all of the work. Jesus Christ came and paid the price and did the work and beat the grave so you could have that. And that's amazing. You do not need to get cleaned up to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. He didn't come for a guy that's already fixed. He came for broken pieces. He came for hurting people. And so he will meet you where you are. You do not have to work to come to salvation. But when you come to salvation and you come to know Jesus Christ, there may be some dirt that gets dug up once you're there. 
right? There may be some dirt that gets dug up while you're there. What do I mean by that? I mean, man, God may show you some things that he says, let's not be about these things anymore. Let's put these things away. This isn't what we're about anymore. They were what you were about, but they're not anymore. He may say, you know, there's some wrongs that you need to right. They're wrong. You know they're wrong. They're your fault. You know they're your fault, and you need to repair that relationship. You need to right that wrong. And again, I say, oh, God, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. And he says, no, you're not, but I will through you. I will through you. You can lay it out there. You can throw it up on me, and I'll clean it up, and we can take care of it if you've got the willing heart to let me build you how I want you built. We can fix it. I can fix it, and you can just enjoy the blessing of having it right. And that's, that's huge, right? And that's huge, but I would encourage you. Man, you, become, you come to know Jesus Christ, and then you start to get this prompting and this prodding. Man, uh, I don't know about this. Well, check it with Scripture. Maybe it's something God wants you to say, now let's put that away. Let's put that away. I'm not condemning you, and I'm not saying, you know, you're a horrible person for this. I'm just saying that's not what God's about, so let's not be about it anymore. You belong to me. It was wrong, and we can right it, because that's what we're going to do, because you belong to me. And so I would just say, be willing to put it out there. Be willing to lay it all on the line. It doesn't make you less of a Christian. It doesn't make you less of a person. It probably makes you a better Christian. <laughs> It probably makes you a better Christian. And you don't need a suit and you don't need all that. Just put it out there and say, God, I'm yours. I've given my life to you. And then when he says, well, let's do this and let's do that and let's do this, then just do them. Be willing to let him work and let him do them. Uh, Psalms 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. God is going to clean out the heart. God is going to clean up that mess that we've made of our lives or whatever it may be. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things are new. The things that you were before, the things that defined you, the things that, that you thought made you who you were, they're gone. They're gone, and it's a clean slate today, and today they're new. And I get to new things, new God-breathed things. That's... Nice, right? He's begun a good work in you, and he'll continue to do it, and he'll finish the good work. He will. It's not something we have to do, but the old ways are gone, and now there's new ways. And yeah, great, right? New ways. I like new ways compared to my old ways. And maybe you're a seasoned vet, and again, you say, okay, that's all nice for the new guy. Well, let it be a reminder to us as old guys, or you as old guy. But how about this? He dug deep to lay a foundation, and it says he laid his foundation on a rock. So let's, let's for the sake of this, um, we're calling, right, Jesus is the rock, and let's call the foundation our relationship with God. Let's call the foundation our relationship with God, and then we're the little man. Well, it says he dug deep. So now when I look at it like this, it's like, man, you're digging deep for that relationship, to strengthen that relationship with God, right? To get to that foundation, which is a good, strong relationship with him. The same thing. There might be some stuff in the way between me and my relationship with God or the relationship that God wants for me, right? We say, well, man, God, what are you trying to do? Where should we go? Where, how should we minister? And there's dirt. There's dirt in between me and my relationship with God. And I would just encourage you, let's clean up the dirt. <laughs> let's clean up the dirt. Let's dig it up. Let's dig it up. Let's remove it. And it doesn't have to be horrible sins or horrible things, but I think about the worldly distractions that are constantly around us, right? I think about anything that inhibits your growth in Jesus Christ, and I classify it as dirt, right? All the stuff that's, it's not bad. It's just meaningless. It's not bad. It just has no eternal value. And it's not bad. It just is bad because it stops you from having the relationship with God that you and he want. And we profess to say, no, 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 no. I want a relationship with God. I want to hear his voice. I want to this and I want to that and I want to do for God. And I believe you and I'm in the same situation. But are we removing the distractions 
the hindrances that get in the way of that relationship from growing. And if they're there and he shows them to you, man, I say, I say clean them out. Clean them out. Lay aside every weight and sin that does beset you. Put them aside. You would look like a knucklehead to run a race with weight on your back. I watch this video. I don't know how I see these videos. I am not into social media. I saw this video at the race. A guy runs long cross-country style, you know, uh, strong man. What are those? Sean probably knows what they're called. You know, these like death runs. And they're, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff through the woods and this. It's crazy. But this one, you carry your wife. She cannot touch the ground. It's 30 miles and you carry your wife. So the strategy, I watched too much, okay? I watched too much. But the strategy is literally, I put you on my shoulders, but not like you put a kid on your shoulders. She's upside down and her legs are here and I'm holding her knees. And then she's got her hands around my waist. And that's how we run 30 miles or however far it is. I'm like, are you tripping? <laughs> And of course, we want to be fast, so I need to remove my hand. So then she holds her own legs, and she's holding on like some kind of weird spider monkey. And you're just, ta, 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 ta. and I'm like, what? Well, OK, cool. I think it's cool. That's a cool little race. But I don't want to run a race with joy on my back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Put down the weights. Put down the weights. Put them aside. Joy is not a weight. She's not a hindrance to me. But that idea of carrying around extra baggage, that would be ludicrous to win a race and throw somebody else or weights or the junk of the world on your back and then think you're going to finish with the time that you want to finish. You know what I mean? It won't happen. It won't happen. You put them aside, and I don't care how fast you are and how good of a race you run, when you put the weights aside, it will be faster and it will be better. It's just how it is. It's just how it is. So, man, put the waist to the side. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I understood as a child understands. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put the childish things away. Well, maybe for some of us that have been believers for a long time, maybe for some of us that know Christ and have a relationship with him, but, man, we've got this dirt in between, and it's time to put the childish things away and do some manly things. Do some God things. Do some real God things. Put the childish stuff away. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's me. Let us look and say, man, what do I got going on that is distraction, is junk in the way, is junk in the way, is junk in the way. Put them away. Put them away. Find a quiet place, man. Fill the, you say, I'm, I'm not going to watch so much TV. Okay. Read the Bible instead. Read the Bible instead. Spend some quality time with your wife instead. Spend some quality time with your kids. Do something profitable. Go outside and enjoy God's great creation instead. Don't turn off the TV to lay in bed like a dead man. You know what I mean? Oh, God's given me a commitment. I watch too much TV. So I'm going to watch basketball instead of football. I love basketball, but... How about you turn it all off and spend some time with God? And I'm talking to me here. We've, we've got these guys, and, I mean, it's like life support. I don't answer this thing. Trust me, I've got 15 missed phone calls within three minutes because why in the world would you not answer your phone, Chris? <laughs> why, what has possibly gone wrong that you did not answer this in 10 seconds of it calling? Yeah, I don't know, <laughs> right? We're just, but just... Put them aside. Put the childish things aside and run the race the way God would, would have us to run it, right? Um, spend some time with him. Spend some time, so, spend some time in, some, in some godly things. I found for me, for me, uh, and uh, it fits, it fits biblically for me. So if you think otherwise, don't tell me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. For me, I can spend better time with God, and I can get away with some distractions by doing things for God. It's not just sit down and read your Bible, okay? We're trying to update Children's Church a little bit. I don't know if you know this, but the projector has been less than great. 
for a while, right? And so we hung a new TV in there. We've got some internet in there. We're doing some things to kind of update it. And to me, that is quality God time spent for me. I like doing that. And it builds my relationship with God to do that. Does that make sense? I, I, we've done some work in the sound room, forced by coronavirus. But man, doing those things, working in the sound booth, strengthens my relationship with Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Now, that's just for me. Maybe not for you, right? Another one for me is literally just being outside. Just being outside. God's creation is amazing. It is amazing. It's astonishing. And, like, being outside, growing some lettuce over the winter, strengthened my relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, it does not have to, right? It may not do that for you, but for me... It just became good quality time where I ponder about God things. It becomes a time when I can go out and I see that and I say, man. And it turns into a conversation with God that I wouldn't have had watching basketball. You know what I mean? And so I don't know what they are for you, and I'm not saying you're, you don't have a quality Bible time because it's probably better than mine. Okay, But I'm just saying wherever you are, high or low or in between, Let's, let, let's, let's get some of the dirt out of the way so we can see that foundation and that relationship with God, and it's good and it's strong, and we're on that foundation. And we've built that relationship with the rock, and that relationship of Jesus Christ is what's between our feet and the rock that is Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? And so, you know, that's, that's kind of that. Now, the other thing that this little phrase, dug deep, kind of just got me. This was the very first one when the guy said it. I went, huh? And we went back to the dorms and I looked up that it said Doug because like I said, I'd never heard that before. And so um, we're going to watch a little video. Can you believe that? That's how prepared I was. A video. A video. We're going to watch a little video that kind of just explains this story. And you guys may watch this video and go, well, Chris, you could have saved me 20 minutes of time because... This says it all beautifully in three minutes. <laughs> but we're going to then go over and we're just going to look. But this, my next point, this idea of dug deep, this kind of helps us see. And so, Mario, if you can cue up the, uh, the little video about us or about this story. And, and how many of you guys on this first video, we'll watch two, um, this first video, how many of you guys can relate or understand that this video represents this story, okay? That's kind of what, what, what we're going with here. Oh, I'm on. Nice. Thank you. Um, that, that's, that's, that's this passage, right? That was this passage to me until we went to state. That right there was exactly what I saw every single time I read this. But then I read, he dug deep. And that painted a completely different picture for me. That is what I saw before, and that was good. Who would subscribe if I gave you the YouTube guy that built that? Who would subscribe to his content? Because it's pretty good. That, that, both of these, custom made from scratch by, by Mario and himself. He put that little guy together, which, yeah. That's pretty good. And, man, when you watch it and you go, oh, come on. That's so easy. Nah, no, it's not. That's what I said before I ran the sound. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, but for real, man, you, graphics, animation, things like that, it is hard. I'm like, oh, man, just put me together a little two-minute video. 20 hours later, well, I'm halfway done. Like, Sorry. But Mario put these together, and he, he did a great job. Um, but 
this is now what we're going to watch, my picture of this story. Uh, that is what it has always been, literally until a month ago. And after he spoke on this, this is now at least how I interpret this story. There you go. There you go. That word dug deep, that little phrase when I read it, I went back to the dorm and I said, so wait, what that picture is telling me is that Christians are, do not live above the water line. Does that make sense? Christians do not live on a mountaintop that, does never, that never gets touched by the streams and rivers of life that beat against all the rest of the world. You know what I'm saying? And I had never seen it that way. God is a high rock, and he is a great place, and he is a refuge, and he is a stronghold, and he's all those things. But as a Christian, God did not promise you. You just came to know him, or you're wrestling to know him. He, is, he did not promise you a mansion above life's rivers and streams and hard storms that come in life. You don't live above the clouds. He never promised that. What he did promise... He promised some great things, better, far better than that. But he didn't promise an easy life. He didn't promise a perfect life. He promised you eternal life with him. That's better than any mountaintop you could ever be put on here on earth. He saved a place for you. He's done those things. He's built literally a paradise for you with no illnesses, disease, allergies. Thank the Lord. Right? Gnats, no gnats. I don't like gnats. I love where we live, and we live next to a guy who raises chickens and peacocks and rabbits and llamas and things that gnats like. So I love our house, but there's gnats, and I will love to be in paradise with no gnats. I just love it. And no allergies. I can't remember the last time I, I breathed out of both nostrils. It's been 25 years probably. It'll be, it's going to be wonderful, right? But he promised us that. He promised a peace that passes understanding. He promised us an unshakable foundation that cannot be broken by the storms of this life. But he didn't promise you to be above those storms. And to me, that's great. That's great. That's wonderful. That is absolutely wonderful. 1 John 5.11. And this is the record that God has given us eternal life. And that life is in his son. He promised you eternal life. Psalm 62, 7. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength. My refuge is in God. He's a refuge. He's a strong place. But to expect a perfect, easy, strife-free life was never promised. Now he says, man, the birds of the air, I feed them. The lilies, I take care of them. The hairs on your head, I know the number. I mean, he's an involved God. I'm not saying he's not an involved God. He's overly involved. He's perfectly involved. He's wonderfully involved, whatever you want to call it. It's just right. It's just right. Well, man, if he's taking care of a bird and a bird doesn't die without God knowing, then I promise you he knows the struggle that's going on in your life. So, man, you're just coming to know Christ or, or, or you're struggling with, man, God, what is this all about? Where do I go from here as a new believer? Man, I'm telling you, he has given you some wonderful promises. But being above the waterline isn't one of them, and that's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And I'll tell you why it's okay here in a minute, okay? I'll tell you why. For those of us that, again, maybe we've been Christians for a while or we, we've, we've got a strong relationship with God and those sorts of things, man, that water line that you have to 
live in, like everybody else has to live in, is, is kind of what draws people to God. I don't know. Let me, let me try to explain, okay? We're not exempt from life's problems. Look at the apostles. <laughs> Look at the people in the Bible. You know what I'm saying? You want to live a problem-free life with no strife? Why, Paul got beat to death more than once. How do you get beat to death more than once? That sounds like a, a, a life with a few problems. You know what I'm saying? You're talking to people that have been boiled in water, that have been hung upside down, didn't have houses, families and friends disowned them, they lost it all to follow God, and you go, no, when I say, Jesus, I love you, come into my heart, the world becomes beautiful again. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. The world doesn't become easily beautiful. You're not walking on clouds and singing. One day, one day we'll get to walk on clouds, but not today. Not today. But take heart. You're in good company, man. The apostles got the stuffings beat out of them everywhere they went for the, the love of God. So it's okay if you've got a storm in your life. And that, that being perfect, as, as, as American Christians, we, I feel like we sell that to people as salvation, right? Come to know Jesus, and he'll fix your life. Ping. Call now, and I'll give you a double dope. No, you know what I'm saying? That's not true. But that is not what attracts people because being an unbeliever, you don't look at a Christian and say, he has absolutely no struggle and that's what I want because it's not real. It's not real to you. I'm in, I'm in a real dirty mud pit and I just want to survive. And so the, the God, the, the draw to a relationship with God is not he puts you on a mountaintop and you'll never touch life again. I think when you sell yourself as a Christian, I'm perfect and everything's great and my wife is wonderful and we never have any problems. It's not very attractive. It seems like it should be, but it's not. I've been there. I've been on that side where it's like, bro, I don't, I don't even want what you're selling. I don't even believe what you're selling. Sitcoms have more drama than you. You know, I don't believe it. But what does draw people? That witness, when you're in the storm, that's what draws people. When you lose a child, when your kids go astray, and your house doesn't shake, and your foundation is still there, and your house isn't crumbled, and the destruction isn't great, that's when people go, wow. That peace that passes understanding in situations that it doesn't make sense, that unconditional love that is shown through Jesus Christ when it doesn't make sense, those are the things that people go, hmm, this is different. Everyone can put on a mask and a smiley face and say life is good, and none of us believe it. But when you're working and you're saying, man, I'm getting my teeth kicked in, but my God is still good. I'm getting it handed to me, but man, look at what God has done for me. And this is where God is moving, and this is where God is, and this is how great my God is. Then... People say, man, okay, we got a little bit of value to this. There's a little bit of weight to this. This is a draw to me. This unconditional love is a draw to me in tough times. This peace that passes understanding is a draw to me. That hope of a future with Christ is a draw to me. The realness of Jesus in a real world is the draw. Does that make sense? So to hide your problems as a saved person and walk around like everything's always great, no, the realness of the relationship is what will attract new people to Jesus Christ. You should not want to be perfect. Well, you should want to be perfect, but you should not want to show yourself as perfect and hide all your little blemishes. If you can spell it out for someone and say, look, this is God. The good that I have is God. And the bad that I have is the work I'm still doing. People can relate to that. People can relate to that. And they want some of that, and they say, man, I, I want a relationship with God because I want when the floods to come and the water recede, I want my house to be standing. That's what I want. That's what I want. And so, man, I would just encourage you guys, remember that. Remember that as a, as a believer. Remember that when you're going to witness and, and you're spreading the, the gospel. Represent Christ the absolute best way that you can represent him. But nobody needs a mask. They just need a real Jesus from a real believer. Matthew 7, 12 through 14, 
It's the scripture about the wide way and the wide gate and the narrow way and the narrow gate. And in there it says, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way. Difficult is the way that leads to life. He's not putting you on a mountaintop. You're right in here with the rest of us, and that's what makes it good. That's, what, that's where ministry can happen, right? You hear about great army generals that slept with the men. They didn't stay up in castles, and those are the best generals because they spoke to people, and their character spoke to people. And the opportunity to see God, the man down on the bottom has a hard time seeing with his little binoculars the great Christian life that's up there on the mountaintop. But when you're standing next to him and your neighbor, they can see that Jesus. Does that make sense? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will be given to you, and it will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. In my Father's house, there are many houses. If it were not so, I, w- I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. Those are the things... Those are, that's what God has given. And those are the things that we should celebrate and celebrate to other people and will become a witness to, uh, to the, the people around us. So there you go, right? There you go. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you who he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock, and when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against the house, it could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who has heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on earth without a foundation, against which the streams beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Let us be people that dig deep and build a foundation on the rock of Jesus Christ. And when the streams come and they beat vehemently against the house, we will be able to say, my God is good and my foundation is strong and I'm still here. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that you you rightly divert... divided your word today, Lord. I thank you that you, you showed us some things, Lord. And I pray that these little gems, Lord, would, would speak to some other people in here like they've spoken to me, Lord. I pray that we would be a people, that we would be a people that when we say, Lord, Lord, it's Lord, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would be a people that when we say, I am yours, Lord, we are yours. I pray that we would be a people that give over the captainship of our life, that hand over the keys and get to enjoy and live in the wonderful celebration of you being in charge, Lord. I pray that we would be people that would dig deep, that the distractions of this world and the dirt that is in between us and the relationship that you want with us, Lord, I pray that we would clean it out. Lord, I pray that you would clean it out. I pray that you would show people, that you would point things, that you would help people to see, hey, this ain't what we're about. It's time. It's time to put away the childish things. It's time to put away the childish things, Lord. And I pray that we would be people that are on the same level as everybody else, that we would understand and we would remember that we are a broken, undeserved people, but yet we serve a God that is so great and we serve a God that is so good and we serve a God that loves and loves unconditionally, Lord, and that that would be the light that shines into our circles and into our workplaces and into our families, that people would see a real God with real promises, Lord, and they would be drawn to you and they would be drawn to you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I pray that we'd have a good day. I pray that we'd enjoy the Sunday. And again, I just thank you for meeting with us. Lord, I thank you for, for the opportunity to sit with you for a while. In Jesus' name, amen.